Hey, thank you everybody for watching this video. I actually had a checklist going down it, but unfortunately I was all over the place instead of going down it in a linear fashion. So hope you guys enjoy the video. Back later. Hey, welcome back to the Midday q and I'm your host, the Duck Man. <laughs> Today's the day where I answer the questions you guys have been asking, and I got a lot of them yesterday. Since I started to get this engine running up here on my 1956 Volkswagen Beetle, that's Eleanor you see right behind me there, up on the body dolly. And uh, I've actually got a list. I've got so many questions and so much ground that I'd like to cover. A lot of these uh, questions are really simple with pretty much one word answers. Some of them might be a little sarcastic, but if I'm getting asked questions that have already been answered many, many times over, if I get a little sarcastic, Sorry. <laughs> One of the first things I'm going to answer that I've been getting asked a lot lately is why do I upload my videos around noon and at midnight? And the reason why is actually I only uploaded videos for a very long time at night, right around midnight. And the reason for that was is because I would work on projects during the day. And then when the sun would go down, I would put everything away, go inside, and get my video editing done. And then right around midnight is typically when I was going to bed, and I'd, you know, hit that upload button and just let it go. And that's just the way it worked out, you know, midnight, that's when the videos go up. I then counterbalanced that by putting a noon video right around lunchtime, you know, noonish, uh, over on VV the Duck VV. And the reason for that is I was, would try to answer the questions that people were asking the night before on the video that I had just uploaded, and, you know, whatever else comes up, and I try to put them in succession. If I forgot no real good questions, and I would do something generic like Dark Man's Eggnog. <laughs> you guys get the point. I see some other big YouTubers do things that are similar, and not a whole lot of them release quite as many videos as I do, and that's probably one of the reasons why I'm growing so quickly. I mean, not to say that I'm absolutely wonderful, awesome, or that I don't make mistakes. I do, and we're going to get to that later in this video, where I actually did make a mistake, and uh, somebody pointed something out, and uh, I kind of was a little sarcastic with him, and didn't need to be. So we're going to offer a official apology for that, too. So I think that pretty much sums it up as to why I put up videos with a 12-hour gap between the two of them, and why I try to keep both of my channels very, very busy. I try to get up at least one video a day, one video a day, whether it be on VV the Duck VV or Duckman Cycles. If I can get two a day, even better, because then I'll have a, an actual tech video and a follow-up Q&A video the next day, and then right back to a tech video later on that night. And spacing them out at about 12 hours is a good thing, that way you don't have a Duckman overload. If I put up two videos at the same time, uh, usually only one of them gets watched, and I've done that before. One is really, really busy, and it's whatever the last one was that I released. The one that got released even just minutes before that is the one that gets, you know, blown off or ignored. I try to space things out so people have chance to catch up. And that also helps us stop with people asking the silly questions because then they can see the order of the events that's been going on and when they finally get to that last video and they're caught up, they're aware of the situation and they don't say, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, that was, you know, in the video I just uploaded previous. <laughs> but if I only had, you know, five minutes between them, they skip to the most recent. And it's just, that's how YouTube pushes it. They show the most recent video most often. Well, anyway, you guys get the drift on that. So anyways, you guys, let's go ahead and move on. I want you guys to please like, comment, subscribe, pluck that little dingle bell you see down there next to the subscribe button and we get updates every time I upload a video. And don't forget to check out Duckman Cycles VW Garage up on the Facebook group page. It's uh, well over 600 members now and it's actually growing, growing, growing. I mean, with a W in there, I made up my own word, growing. Yeah, now I'm, I'm a porky pig, but it, but it, growing. <laughs> no, it's Elmer Fudd that did that, wasn't it? I'm driving in my car, turn on the radio. <laughs> Enough of that horse shit. Anyways, if you'd like to email me, you guys, duckmancycles at duckshit.net. Thanks so much for watching. I really do appreciate you. And uh, right after the intro, we're going to go ahead and get into this list of questions that we've got here. And there's, there's a bunch of them. Thanks for watching. See you in a minute. Alright, we're back. We discussed uh, video times earlier and why I space out the video times between noon and midnight. Once again, just to answer that to people that haven't been paying attention, I upload my tech videos at midnight because I work during the day until it's dark, then I do my video editing. And then the next morning I go ahead and answer the questions that were asked from the night previous and uh, anything else that had come up 
with a Q&A video right around lunchtime the following day. So that's how I try to space things up. I try to get one video up per day. It doesn't matter which channel it's on. Sometimes two videos a day. If that's the way it works out, that's great. And I try to keep lead on the videos too for my Patreons. Anybody that's up on Patreon, I keep sliding off of this bar stool here. <laughs> Anybody that's up on my Patreon usually gets to see the videos around a day early, sometimes up to a week early. Weekends, I try to slow down and take a little bit of a break. I mean, I still wind up putting a lot of work into my vehicle, but I don't do a whole lot of editing because at night I try to I try to be social, I try to get out for a little while. But if I get the video editing before I manage to go out, then you still get a Saturday night release. But uh, I hope that answers that question. I was asked a lot of questions about the fuel system on this because you remember that um, we were having trouble with the uh, MP, no, not MP, no, 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 those are real Weber 34 ICT carburetors that were on there. And uh, the real deal was on them, they cost too much to rebuild, I had to replace the linkage on it. It just wasn't something that I wanted to get into on this car with this engine because this engine's a very, very temporary solution until I get my built up engine. Uh, this car might actually be driving with this engine for maybe a year, maybe two. It all depends on how quickly I get around to um, getting the next engine built and uh, how soon I feel like doing it. Uh, you know, I'll work on my pace and I'll get to it when I get to it, but uh, it's certainly not top of the list right now. So for that reason, we put on a stock carburetor, stock intake manifold. As luck would have it, I managed to find an intake manifold literally just walking out my back door. I was going to the fastback and I actually tripped over it. One of the little um, heat riser legs was actually sticking out next to the back door where it hadn't been before. I had a, uh, an old table from a school that sits behind my back door over there and actually I put a lot of Volkswagen engine parts on top of it. And I guess I hadn't realized that I put an intake manifold on top of it at one point and it, it fell down behind the table and I guess whatever caused it to tumble and fall over and it was actually sticking out the way it never was before and yeah I actually tripped over it. I didn't break my ass or anything but I mean it was a surprise and as I was going forward and looked at my foot and saw it you know it was an intake manifold so I wasn't even the least bit mad. I just brought it right inside and unwrapped the plastic that was on it. It was a little rusty. Sandblasted it, painted it and threw it right on there. And it turned out that uh, the combination actually works pretty well, but I mean, it's stock, it better work well. But one of the problems we are having is that it's running a little bit lean. And uh, when I run that throttle open, you have to open it real slowly and gradually, which is um, a symptom of, of two things. It's either running lean or it's running lean due to the accelerator pump not pumping. Now I've confirmed that the pump does work. Uh, I actually got several suggestions to say people to, uh, people have said to adjust the accelerator pump so that way it pumps more. And that's good when you first rush that throttle open, but the thing is I don't have a problem with slamming a throttle open. It, it does rev up for that, but then it very quickly dies, which indicates to me that the main jet is actually too small and that the thing is running too lean or we have a severe vacuum leak, which is the next thing. I've had multiple people ask me if I have vacuum leaks, but if you watch yesterday's video in its entirety, I actually said in the video twice, two times, you know, I'm mentioning vacuum leaks and that I did check for them and I didn't find any. So that certainly was not a problem. Noisy school bus. <laughs> So I checked for vacuum leaks and, and no, I didn't find any and that was actually included in the video. So I'm sorry for those of you that asked, you know, actually the answer was right there in the video in front of you. The next question I got asked, if it's not revving up, that means your timing's not advancing properly. And, and that could be true in part. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a two stroke bicycle coming down the street. It sounds like he's hauling ass, but he's really not going very fast at all. <laughs> going about maybe 20 miles an hour. Uh, they usually don't have multiple gears, they have whatever they got and that's it. Essentially that's a, a modern moped. It's, it's a bicycle with an engine and that's the definition of moped. Not them scooters you see today that everybody's calling a moped. Even though they legally might be defined as a moped, a moped is not a scooter. A scooter is a scooter and a moped is a bicycle with pedals and an engine. <laughs> As I said, vacuum leaks, there aren't any. Timing could be a problem. We haven't checked the advance on this thing and I will do that with a timing light. And people, some people did ask, did I time it at all? <laughs> About two or three videos ago, I actually did a video just devoted to timing a Volkswagen engine. So the answer is, Yes, or maybe the sarcastic one. No, no, I didn't. I didn't time it. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> All right, uh, I got to ask a couple questions about the fuel pump. The fuel pump, some people said, well, if it's running lean, maybe you should check your PSI. Maybe it's too high. Um, that's contrary to how it works. If my PSI, the pressure rating of the fuel pump was too high, the carburetor would be more likely to leak, which would make it run rich because all that fuel is going to pour down inside of it. It's going to pour out of it. It's going to be gas coming out of everywhere. 
And that's not the problem we're having. We have a problem with a leanness. I think I need to up the size of the jet. And that's not much of a surprise either. The weather is kind of cool, which means the air is denser. I've got a merged header exhaust on here, which is going to flow better, which means the engine's gonna take in more air. And at the same time, I also live at sea level, so I need the biggest jet that I could possibly put in it for, for my environment. Currently got a 130 in it, it's probably going to need to go one or two sizes higher than that, and that's kind of an oddity, but my situation and just where I'm at right now with all these things acting against me, it's not going to be an odd thing to, to have to put a bigger jet in it, it just isn't. So vacuum leaks are not an issue, carburetor does need to have a bigger jet put into it, and the fuel PSI isn't a problem, and boy that jet is noisy. Every time I try to record a video it's like there's all this excessive noise school buses and mopeds and jets flying over <laughs> but it's always a fun time anyways on the subject of the exhaust which I did just mention the uh, exhaust that's on here is a glass pack I guess you really can't see it it's just a little bit off a of frame see here there it is you can see the glass pack exhaust everybody and I mean the resounding everybody actually really really likes the sound of that exhaust pipe and I gotta admit I do too and that's the reason why I got it I was running the same one on the fastback and I've had it on there for probably about I don't know a year and a half two years and I'm just really happy with it and I get a lot of compliments on it it has a nice rumble to it but it's not too damn noisy it's just it isn't and uh, I, I don't mind starting this thing up even in the evening, I don't worry about it waking people up. I don't worry about it, uh, you know, disturbing the neighbors. I don't run power tools and stuff late anyway, which is another question. Do my neighbors mind me with all the stuff that I do here? And honestly, no, they don't. My neighbors come over all the time. I help them with welding stuff. I let them borrow my tools. Sometimes I run over there when their battery is not turning over their car, and I'll go charge their battery for them or jump them off. I mean, you know, I'm the guy in, in the in the neighborhood here that everybody comes to when they have a problem. So nobody nobody complains about me really. But you know, I'm also very courteous. You know, I might do a project or something but I don't make noise every day constantly all the time you know it's like a construction worker if somebody were building a house you're gonna hear hammering all day long and then they stop you know there's a, there's a point where you're gonna stop building and that's the case here too I mean I work on these projects but when I'm turning a wrench or something I'm really not making a whole lot of noise you know how much noise is that really you know even when it comes down to, to fabricating metal or welding you know I have this uh, pair of shears they're quiet they're no louder than a drill you know you don't even hear the sound of them snipping. It's just the sound of the, the, the rotary motor that turns through there and uh, maybe the occasional sound of me whacking something with a hammer, boink, you know, and then I weld it in place and it's done. The next day when I pull the grinder out, that's another story, but once again, I try to do all my grinding at once so that way you don't hear a whole ton of grinding over a long period of time. It's just, it's all at once and it's short and sweet and it's, it's done. All right, let's see, what else we got? On that subject about the fuel pump, which was still a subject until I diverted from there, but uh, the fuel pump I like is electric, and I've answered this in a few videos before, but I'm still continuing to get asked it. Why do I want to run an electric pump instead of an old mechanical stock pump? And the answer to that is really simple. Number one reason, cosmetics. I like a clean engine compartment. I want more things out of the engine compartment, and one of the things that could cause a leak or start a fire is a fuel pump in the engine compartment. And I've seen it happen, it's happened to me. The little brass nozzle actually shot right out of the fuel pump, and fuel sprayed all over, all over the engine, and I managed to catch it just as it started, and, and the thing just coincidentally stalled right at that time. That was either a surprise to me, but... Uh, I was able to put it out, I was able to go over the wiring, some of the wires got a little crispy and touched each other, and um, got it fixed and got away from there before the fire department ever even showed up. As I was driving down the street, all the fire department were coming down the road. I mean, totally a priceless situation to go through all that nonsense. Freak out, absolute freak out. I'm standing in the street with my shirt off, beating out the fire, and just minutes later I'm driving away. You know, what other car can you do that with? You know, if my, my Nissan caught fire, I'm <laughs> There's no stopping that. I mean, I might be able to put it out, but it's done. Volkswagen, no problem. All there is is one power wire that actually goes through that engine. And we're going to discuss that. When it comes to the fuel pump and electric, the other thing I like is I like the ability to go up to the dashboard, flip a switch, the fuel pump is off. So I can sit there with the key on the, to the ignition on. I can actually turn off the ignition coil also because I have a separate switch for that. At the same time, I can turn off the fuel pump. So I can actually be running my radio, not worrying about frying my points or my electric ignition. No worries about the fuel pump continuing to pump when it doesn't need to. Why shouldn't I run on electric? Shouldn't I? With these added benefits, why is it a bad idea? 
The answer is, it's not a bad idea. And I'm gonna keep my electric pump, and I like my electric pump, and it's the same pump that I have on the Fastback. And the reason why the Fastback has an electric pump is because there's no provisions or hole in the case to put a mechanical pump on there anyway. And one of the reasons for that actually is, is because the fuel pump sits up too high, and you can't close the lid on the engine. That's one of the reasons why they didn't put a fuel pump on top of the Type 3 engine. Uh, it was also um, you know, fuel injected anyway, so originally it, it was, it was a, um, it was an electric fuel pump system. I think it had 25 PSI or something in it. And that old fuel pump was actually on the, the Fastback at the time when I got it. And it was pumping to the carburetors, which only needed about, you know, 3 PSI. Which is what my fuel pump on here runs. Good for carburetors, right about 3 PSI. I think it might actually be rated for 3.5. But 3.5, you know, half a PSI isn't going to kill me. If it were 6, you know, doubling, okay, we might have a problem. 10, well, certainly not. 25? <laughs> Somebody's a dummy if they hook it up that way. And that's the way I got that car. It was easy to fix, change out the fuel pump, plug everything back in with the same wiring. It was up and running and all those, those gushing problems that we had all went away. Once again, still getting critiqued for my tins being dirty or some of the tins actually missing. This, um, this is something that I've discussed more than once. I've talked about it many times in many different comments. It's in several different videos, but no, I needed to put everything together. I wanted to make sure this engine works. I wanted to make sure that things run properly. Now that they do, or almost do anyway, I'm going to make a few more adjustments. But now that they almost do, I'm just about getting ready to pull these tins back off, clean them up, repaint everything, and make it meticulous and put it all back together. But I don't have any reason, any idea, or any reason why anybody would think that I should have to do that now. I mean, it makes no sense to do that now. You clean up all these tins and then you go to put them together and they don't fit. And we already run into that a couple times on this where stuff just didn't fit. So why the hell would I go through all the effort of cleaning everything up and making everything perfect when it's not right? And there's still parts on here that don't fit right. And someone else critique me for that. You know, some of your tins don't fit right. They have big holes in them that you're not going to be using. It's going to let the hot air from underneath the... Well, no shit. <laughs> And I heard that a lot. I did say in one of my previous videos that these tins don't fit properly and I have some of the wrong tins put together that don't belong together. While they do essentially fit, there's gaps between them. There's actually openings that needed to be a panel welded into it and welded shut. And I don't have a problem doing that. And uh, some people are ahead of me and telling me you know, I'm using the wrong parts or I need to replace this and that. You know, I've already covered that. Just taking a rag and wiping off uh, the tins isn't really going to do the trick either because a lot of what you're looking at is rust. You know, rust doesn't just wipe off. Sure, I could throw some phosphoric acid on it, but I'm wasting my product because, once again, I don't know if all these parts are going to fit. And I also studied the uh, doghouse shroud that's on here and I discovered it also has a huge rust hole in it because there was water sitting in a part of it and I don't feel like fixing it. And since that shroud's not going to be used anyway because it has the heater outlets on it, it's going to go bye-bye. I also got critiqued a few times for missing tins. There are some tins that wrap around the uh, front of the engine on the underside, and then there's big long ones that go around the back side of the engine underneath. It goes underneath the uh, push rod tubes. And those are not there. They're not present. And I'm well aware of that. And I did say in a previous video that I wasn't going to put all of them on there. Now people are starting to ask, well, why? Your engine's going to overheat. Well, the thing is, if you're not running the engine for more than, you know, a minute or two, how's it going to overheat? There's no opportunity for it to. You know, even drag racers, some of the drag racers with how hot their engines get, high performance engines, have no tins at all. They actually go right down that drag strip, they only run that thing for a couple minutes and they shut it off. They're done. It doesn't even need any cooling tins at all, let alone the ones that are here on the bottom that are missing. I've got them. I'm just not going to put them on. It's not worth my effort climbing around underneath the vehicle just to determine that if they fit, because they're going to fit, there's only one, one type of those that they're not like. The, uh, not like some of the parts that are here on the upper that fit a little differently between different years. So yeah, it's not really a big concern of mine. Another school bus. Not really a big concern of mine to get these tins cleaned just yet. We're almost there. We're almost there. We're gonna get this engine running a little bit better. So we're gonna do a little more tuning on that carburetor. I'm gonna try to figure out why it uh, the idle screw doesn't seem to do what it's supposed to do. It'll raise the idle, but it won't lower it beyond a certain point even when I get that screw tightened all the way. Some people say, well, maybe the screw is damaged, but the answer is it's a brand new screw. Um, brand new old stock, this carburetor has never been used, but that doesn't mean that, you know, somebody didn't take it out or drop it or hammer it or maybe some, some shit got behind it and it's causing the screw not to, to go all the way into its seat properly. So, I mean, there's, there is possibilities, you know, things that could be wrong there and, and we'll determine that when I get to it, but I haven't gotten that far yet. So you guys are a few steps ahead of me if you're saying that, but I'm going to tear into that. I'm going to try to upgrade the jet on this thing and a few other parts and we'll see where we go from there. 
But uh, the not overheating issue by missing tins comes to another thing. And I owe a little apology to Josh Hill. He actually spotted that my intake manifold on here started to freeze. And I say, yeah, it's not gonna freeze. The humidity wasn't particularly high that day. But what I didn't think is that it was actually kind of cold. When I was recording that video on, um, it was Sunday night, if I'm not mistaken, the temperature had dropped to like 46, 47, 48 degrees Fahrenheit. And the wind was blowing and it was cold. It wasn't humid, but it was cold out. Now, as you know, I was only running an engine for like a minute or two and I said that already. No chance for the engine to really get hot. But that also means that the uh, intake manifold didn't get the preheaters hot yet either. Those two little tubes that you see that go up into the intake manifold actually come off the off of the exhaust and I don't remember which direction it goes but the exhaust has a tendency to travel one way and it causes the intake manifold to get hot of course exhaust gases are hot and that's the only heat that you really want in the engine compartment with an intake manifold that long it is prone to icing and icing does happen and he wasn't wrong the ice actually started to appear right along here in that video I didn't even notice it myself but yeah it did start to appear there and later in the video when I shut the engine off you could actually see the heat from the heat riser start to wick into the manifold and the ice was starting to melt as the heat was rising up into it. So the uh, heat risers are doing their job. They just didn't get that opportunity to really work well yet. So I, I kind of said something snarky as a response to him, you know, and I forget what it was. I was kind of short with him, a little bit snippy, and I think that was completely unnecessary. So Josh, I'm really sorry for that. There are times that I'm wrong, and I do take responsibility when I am wrong, and I, I am really sorry for that one, really. You know, big apologies for just being, being kind of a jerk. I mean, you were absolutely right. You were absolutely right. And um, during video edit, I noticed one other thing, and I don't know if it's related in any way to the intake icing, but right up in here, when I was pumping the throttle, it only happened once, there was a wet spot that appeared somewhere up underneath there. And I don't know if it was actually on the manifold or if it was on the cooling shroud up in there, but it, something got wet right after I hit the throttle one time. And it didn't seem to do it any other time. It didn't do it before then. But it seems like the accelerator pump might be leaking on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that diaphragm on there. I don't have any idea how old that diaphragm is on there. It could be very old. It could be very young. I mean, it could be replaced at some point. I do know that this carburetor, or at least I believe this carburetor is a new old stock one. It's been just sitting on a shelf wrapped in a, in a cardboard box with VW logos all over it. It actually had styrofoam in there, too, that fit it perfectly. Kind of, kind of a weird thing to me, but um, that's how it was. And uh, it was in just some really good shape. I figured it would work and sure enough it did, but it's going to need a little bit of adjustments. I mean, things are going to be a little different from how I want to set them up. So we're going to get to that and we'll get to that very shortly in, in, a, in a video, maybe even tonight, if I can gather my tools together and I can find some bigger jets. And I think I have a couple of rebuilds, Solex rebuild kits for this carburetor. So I'm going to dig for that stuff too. And I'm going to see if we can piece this thing back together and make it work properly. And once again, that means we get to run them. And uh, let's see, what else we got on this list? No, I think I just about nailed everything except for one thing. I got to ask about the engine's wiring. You know, what does it take to wire up a Volkswagen engine? And they're really quite simple. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this camera and I'm going to get down and I'm going to show you where the connections are on this thing and, and what it takes to hotwire one and just how simple they actually are. Be right back, just a second. Okay, on a Volkswagen, typically on a Beetle, the battery lives up underneath the right-hand side rear seat. And that's the situation where it's at right now. There's normally a ground wire that goes to it. I've taken it off because I'm going to get a replacement for it. And there's a positive wire, and actually I've got them reversed. The ground should be on this side. The positive is on that side. Typically, the positive wire will run from here right up to the starter motor, right there on that nut. So right off of the positive, right up to that nut. Another smaller gauge wire would run from there over to the wiring harness. If you have an older Beetle that has a generator on it, there's usually a voltage regulator right over there. Sometimes it's in the engine compartment, almost never. Most of the uh, Beetles that had generators, you'd find it right over here on the left-hand side, underneath the rear seat. And that's where your wiring harness would typically run through. But when you're hot wiring a Beetle, you need to just run the ground to ground. You need to run that positive wire which I actually have here is just a green wire. Real simple. You take it and you run it over to the positive side of the coil. The negative side of the coil gets one connection and one connection only. That's the one to the distributor. I actually just ripped it off earlier here by accident. But it goes to the distributor and only the distributor. You do not ground the negative side of your coil. The distributor will ground it for you when it opens and closes those points. Then off of the coil, and this is that red wire that you see here. So the same place that this green connector is, is red wire on the other side. The red wire goes to the idle shutoff plunger. 
and then it goes up and around to the choke and currently that got knocked off of here by accident but it should be on the choke just like that and then I take that wire and I touch it to the battery I don't have any switches or any fuses at this time but as soon as that touches there all of a sudden you'll hear the uh, fuel plunger open up you'll feel the choke starting to get warm and the coil is now fired and ready to well it's not fired but it is ready to go it's now juiced up the distributor will actually fire it once you start cranking it over now what I've also done here is I've got my test light and I connected the one end of the test light to the oil sender right here and then I connect the positive up to the choke so that way I have a little indicator light that lets me know when the oil pressure has a problem light comes on when there's an issue light is off when it's fine so that's how that works and the only thing that's additional to it is I do have a fuel pump I currently just got laying right there but I have it grounded you can see the rep to the ground strap right over there and then I take the positive wire and touch it to the positive and it gets up and running just like that there's really nothing to it I don't worry about fuses or switches or any of that stuff because I'm just hot wiring it just to see how this thing's gonna work and obviously as you saw in the video I got it working just fine I think I should answer the wiring for you guys I hope that uh, clears some stuff up uh, I hope that clears up a lot of the questions that I've been asked so I'm gonna thank all of you for watching and all of you for sticking around um, I think this video is actually getting like a lot long like way long <laughs> but I really hope that does clarify a lot of the things that I've been asked and uh, maybe even answer some of the things you haven't asked yourself so as always don't forget like comment subscribe pluck that dingle belly you see down there next to the subscribe button and we get updates every time I upload a new video and don't forget check out Duckman Cycles and VW Garage up on the Facebook group page. And if you'd like to email me, duckmancycles at duckshit.net. Thanks a lot for watching, you guys. We'll be back later. Take care.